I have the uh, producer director here. Uh, he is a star of Current TV, and he is now engaged in this uh, in this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, Max Lugavere. All right, Green Day, Green Day fans out there, yeah. this is Brain Stew. So, um, Max. Tell me about getting Hollywood interested in science. Yeah, so um, a little bit of background on my work. I started as one of the main anchors of Al Gore's TV network, Current. Uh, and my role there was pretty much to get young people excited about the way in which t t technology was democratizing the tools of storytelling. Um, and that sort of, you know, it was amazing because at the time, Current was very ahead of its you know, ahead of the curve, YouTube had yet to really become ubiquitous at that point. Uh, but a sort of underlying thread um, from, you know, my time at Current and, you know, even before that when I was in college was always the way technology was impacting health and the way we were sort of at this radical, the cusp of a radical tsunami of possibility as far as like health was going. And I kind of saw that. That's one of the reasons why I didn't go into, you know, medicine um, when I was in college. I ended up becoming a, a storyteller. Uh, and you know, I found over the years that that science was definitely siloed off to the more academic communities, but that has definitely changed. Um, I think today people are more interested in science and health and things like that than ever before. In fact, uh, a study that I love um, that was done in-house at the New York Times found that the most shared articles from the New York Times were those that inspired awe. And they were like, well, what is awe? It's kind of a nebulous concept. Well, it's usually things about science and about you know, the ways in which technology pertains to sort of our health and our, our everyday lives. Um, and so that's like the media side of things. But then I've always really sort of intuited this idea that food is information. I've, I've always been a massive junkie for health and wellness. And it's sort of, uh, I'm very much of Ray Kurzweil's school of thought that biology can be reprogrammed. Like, I'm a big fan of the singularity, but my favorite book of his is Fantastic Voyage, which is about the way you can eat so that you can make it to the singularity. Um, and so, yeah, and so the genesis of this project uh, came when, to use you know, a popular term, um, shit became real for me when, when my mom started having these sorts of kinds of cognitive uh, difficulty. And, um, and so I, I felt at once you know, upset by the whole thing, but very empowered too, because I feel like I was at this unique intersection where I could sort of see everything from 30,000 feet. And, um, you know, it just, that's sort of the genesis of the journey. Yeah. For me. So you've started filming already. Who are, who are some of the, the guys that you put on film already? Yeah, so um, we started uh, up in um, Boston where we were shooting with Dr. Alessio Fasano, who is sort of the gluten guy. He's the founder of the Center for Celiac Research. Brilliant, brilliant dude. And then, um, we went down to Brown University to film with Suzanne de Lamonte, who coined type three diabetes. She's one of the people coined, credited as, as having coined that term. And um, that was a really awesome interview for me because that's one of the, the, the headlines that I saw that most inspired me. This idea that our most feared disease could be a form of diabetes of the brain because, I mean, how empowering is that, right? Like we know why people become diabetic if we're talking about, you know, diabetes type two. And, uh, you know, that, that these sorts of neurodegenerative problems could be metabolic in origin to me was, was very eye opening. You know, um, my, my mother, you know, New York Jew grew up eating bagels and thinking that that was, you know, like totally healthy and avoiding fat. And she, when she gave me my first omelet as a kid, she was like, you can only eat these like, you know, once a week because they're, you know, they'll clog your arteries. And, uh, and so the idea that, that somebody who tried to be health conscious her whole life was led astray, you know, by the powers that be to me was just, just eye opening in many ways. So what are your, your sort of hopes for, for this project um, at the end of it? I mean, it seems like if we have to work with 30 year olds who have no symptoms, we've got to try and create media that's going to capture that attention. A hundred percent. And I think that's why, look, I'm completely humbled to be in the room speaking at an event with some of the most brilliant people I've ever encountered. But I think that part of the way that we can sort of get this message to younger people is by surprising them. And I think that's why I've gotten some of the traction that I've gotten so far without the film even, I mean, it's not even public. You can't even Google the film. Um, 
because it's a little world exclusive right here at the yeah. functional forum. <laughs> yeah, it's a little surprising that a guy with zero symptoms could be so into this topic and so knowledgeable. And I think that I just I speak for I hope that I that I'm able to speak for millennials who who wouldn't let something like that happen. You know, we're we, we're we're wonder junkies. We want to know as much about our health as we possibly can. You know, we're we're here in real time witnessing the cusp of the quantified self revolution. You know. The more we can know about ourselves, the more we can measure, the more we can manage and improve. And so I, I think that that's just something that like my generation like intuitively gets. And so if I can sort of help spread that message to somebody who might not pay attention if the message is coming from a guy in a lab coat, and if I can affect one person doing that, then I feel like I've, I've done my job. And I've been particularly inspired by you know, guys like Dr. Richard Isaacson, Dr. David Prohl, you know, guys who are really ushering in this idea of, of Alzheimer's prevention. Um, because what I found is that, you know, by the time, and this is what I what I've learned in my in my research, by the time somebody actually presents to a neurologist, if you accept the idea that changes in the brain begin 30 years before the first symptom, then it's too late, already possibly. So so you know, my I'm obsessed with brain health. I want to you know I want my brain to be function functioning optimally, and so that's what I'm trying to disseminate. Now, you were a healthy dude before, but now you've been seeing Dr. Isaacson. Yeah. Tell everyone about your regimen that they could be getting all their patients on. Um, well, I definitely eat a, a low-carbohydrate diet. So, you know, if you accept the idea that, that Alzheimer's is a form of diabetes of the brain, um, you know, and that's an idea, uh, then you want to eat as low-carbohydrate, I think, as you can. Um, there was a study that came across my Twitter feed yesterday saying that the best way to treat and manage type 2 diabetes is with a low carbohydrate diet. Um, I feel like I'm functioning best when my insulin levels are not, you know, roller coastering. And uh, I also eat a lot of sort of brain healthy fats like walnuts and omega 3s, DHA, stuff like that. Um, I like coconut oil, you know, I like coconut stuff uh, in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and Dr. Isaacson turned me on to uh, cocoa powder and turmeric. And um, what was very interesting was that I, and this is sort of something that I'm learning as I sort of go down the rabbit hole, my, so again, I eat a very paleo-friendly diet. Um, and I was kind of shocked to see that my LDL particle size was not optimal. It wasn't bad, but it was less optimal than I would assume for a guy who watches every single thing that he eats. And um, and so I think that there's a very large nutrigenomic component there to everybody. And so, so part of what I've learned that I also try to spread is this idea that, like I fully buy that you can advocate a one-size-fits-many approach, but a one-size-fits-all approach is, is a little unrealistic. Because, you know, as we sort of go down the sort of epigenetics rabbit hole and we learn more about the interplay between our genome and the food that we eat in our environments, you know, we're going to see that some people don't react the same way to saturated fat. And I, you know, apparently was, you know, is one of those people. So uh, one of the things that I learned that was talked about in that um, Wall Street Journal article is that maybe I should lower my saturated fat intake. Okay. Well, hopefully this is exciting. We'll have a new generation of millennials seeking out doctors doing this type of medicine in a couple of years. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Max Lugavere. Thanks, Max, for being here. Thank you, guys. Okay.